Welcome back, everyone. You're watching We Heart Therapy, the special series EFT Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Bell, aka Annabelle Bugatti, licensed marriage and family therapist and certified EFT supervisor and therapist here in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. And I am super excited to bring to with us today is Gretchen Harrow. She is the um, EFT trainer from the Chicago Center for EFT, and she's a licensed marriage and family therapist and has a private practice in a suburb of Chicago. And I'm so excited that we get to have her on our show today. And we are going to be talking about da -da -da, attunement. <laughs> yes, yes, that word that we use at all of our trainings and is common to the EFT language and attachment. But you know, as some of you guys have figured out, it's not quite as simple and smooth and easy as we would all like it to be all the time. So hence why we're going to uh, make this video. So Gretchen, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. I've been a, a watcher of your videos for a long time. So it's fun to finally be here. So thanks. Absolutely. So if you can go ahead, maybe start us off with sort of giving everyone an idea of what do we mean when we use the word attunement? Like, what the heck is that? I know. I was thinking about that. Like when you look it up, like in the dictionary, there's like not a great definition. So I was like, what do we mean by that? And the first thing that came to my mind was resonating. And then I'm like, well, what does resonating mean? And it's like when you're with another person, it's getting to a place where you are feeling what the other person is feeling and you are getting it, not just in your brain cognitively, but it's a felt sense in your body that then the person that you're with, whether it's a client or a friend, um, that, that person has a sense of, oh, you get it. And it's almost like they can relax a little bit. It's like, I'm not alone with whatever I have anymore. There's another person in the world who's like, oh, and you can just kind of take that sigh because you feel felt. You feel like someone's yeah. there with you. Um, yeah. And it's part of you know what we do in EFT. It's being accessible, responsive, and engaged. So that's some of maybe some behaviors that we put with that. But it's 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 an embodied feeling that you have and that the other person has. I love what you're saying. So let me let me think about. So when you're defining attunement, what sort of comes to my mind is. I think of like a radio or, okay, because my brain thinks in images and, sure. <laughs> and movies. So I think of like a radio or a TV, like those old fashioned ones with the knobs yes. where you had to like tweak the dial to tune in to a channel to pick up a signal. So it's like the art of somebody tuning in to another, to their signals, to their cues, to their clues, to their vibe, their emotion, mm -hmm. right. and to pick up what they're trying to transmit basically yeah yeah that's right and uh, even just that motion it's just mm -hmm. sometimes it's just the slightest things that mm -hmm. people that the indications that they give can be so small mm -hmm. and if we're preoccupied if we're not attentive to them we're going to miss them so yeah. so there's and we'll, I mean, we're going to be talking a lot about like how do you how do you attune to somebody but certainly there is a a, a focused attention that's part of it so that you can tune in um, and, and find those little micro moves that people I sort have. of feel like attunement lays on the line of like sort of some advanced nuanced social skills like the art of tuning into the social cues around you and paying attention to them and making yeah. sure that you're picking up what's being laid down basically you know yeah yeah, yeah exactly very much that so that might be a funny way of, of thinking about it, but, you know, why is it important that we have good attunement? Not just as therapists, we'll maybe share why it's important as humans, but also as therapists. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so starting with therapists, if it's, we are inviting clients to go to vulnerable places, to tender places, and places maybe that they've never told anyone and if they don't feel like we're paying attention or we're not getting it we're not going to be safe and they're they're just not going to say things to us they're not going to go to those places where there can be real healing if they don't feel a, our attunement with them if they don't feel felt by us mm -hmm. so clinically that's true and you know, that's one of the, I, I know you know this, that one of the things about EFT that's so amazing is that we learn it 
to help our clients, but it comes into all of our relationships, whether it's the, the people that we're closest to, or even, um, you know, the people that you meet it, um, as you're going about your day, it, it kind of reminds me, um, I hadn't planned to, to say this, but I was, I was on the phone the other day with a call center. I was trying to pay a bill, website wasn't working, so I called. And so this woman at a medical billing, you know, she's used to people who are in a hurry, who are rushed and impatient. And so she's like apologizing to me over and over. I'm sorry I'm taking so long. I make a lot of mistakes. And without really even thinking about it, but just kind of knowing what it's like for people in call centers, she said, Oh, I make a lot of mistakes. And just I just said, I bet you get a lot more things right than wrong. Hmm. And she just felt seen. And she's like, you made my day. And hmm. I'm thinking, that was so easy <laughs> that I made your day. But she had a sense of, oh, here's someone who's not like feeling annoyed with me or just trying to get past me, but who has a sense of what it's like to work in a call center. Yeah. So that's an everyday example. Of, it's, it's almost like just kindness. Yeah. Um, but kindness comes when you're tuned into somebody. Feels good that people really see us and understand our experiences and, and our vantage point, but also that they would see what I like about a tomb is really like seeing, seeing the best in people or, or yeah, finding the, the tenderness or the, the gentleness, the compassion it stance from their vantage point, you know, which is, yeah. is a good human skill, a good people skill to have, to tune into people around you. You know, I hear people, you know, clients often talk about being socially awkward. And, you know, mm -hmm. I find attunement is one of those things that can be quite low is the ability to really just tune into others and just sort of, you know, I find like half the battle is just that discomfort with just looking and, and tuning oh. in. You know, and then the other part is how do you make sense out of what you see, you know, but I love also what you're saying about being a therapist and, you know, hopefully a lot of you guys are seeing therapists. Yes, your therapist should be having a therapist because, you know, we want to also stay mentally fit and healthy, just like hopefully your doctor is going to see a doctor too, <laughs> you know, but, you know, I've had therapists in the past where it's like, you know, I know that I need to share something that's really deep and personal, but if I feel like, you know, they're not really tracking and like actually tune into my experience and I'm saying something and they're responding back with a statement that feels like they're way out in left field. I'm like, why would I even go deeper with you when you're not going to catch me there? You're not going to see me. You're not going to understand me. Like, that's not going to be a good experience at all. You're going to feel trapped most likely if you go there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's an element of just remembering and holding in our minds, this is another human. Mm -hmm. And they have the you know, concerns like I do, they have worries like I do, they have joys like I do. And it's looking for that humanity, maybe underneath some very defensive or critical or, you know, all the moves that they have to survive in the world. Like what's, what's underneath that and believing that there's something there. Mm -hmm. um, is a piece of it. Well, an attachment helps us know that there's something there more than than what we see on the surface. Like I always say that behavior is like the tell, you know, of something deeper, you know, if you're like, if you're looking at a tree, the leaves are the tell about what's growing at the roots. You know, if you see the leaves yeah. in a disease state, then, you know, an arborist is going to know, Hey, you might have some tree bark disease or this or that, you know? So yeah, exactly. it's just like, well, let's go and cut off all the leaves, <laughs> you know? So it's super important. And, and I know some, some folks can, it, it can be a struggle to really see what's underneath. And, you know, I, I've heard some therapists also, and, and I've struggled with this, you know, in my early days as well, sort of this myth that, you know, because couples therapy, you have two people now that you need to tune in and catch and see and understand. And, you know, I guess, you know, there was this belief that if you're tuning into one partner, then the other one's going to feel like, oh my gosh, you're, you're, whoa, that's scary. You're seeing them and, and that means you're not. Yeah. 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 Could you speak to that a little bit? Oh, yeah. Well, um, that's a big part of our work in the beginning, right? Of building the alliance of, um, it, of letting both people know I'm hearing you. I'm on the side of your relationship. 
and even making the invitation to someone and saying, if you ever feel like I'm siding with your partner, I hope that you will tell me because that means I need to shift how I'm engaging with you. Um, and, you know, early days, it's also just that intentional shift back and forth of making sure you don't spend too time, too much time with one person because that's in that way she's always talking to them. The other person might start to feel like, yeah, you're not getting me. So it's it's yeah. balanced, especially in the early days, and also the invitation of let me know if you feel like you're not being heard, basically. Yeah, I wonder if part of it comes from, you know, when we're first really learning EFT, part of one of the things that we really focus on is being able to have two truths and to see both. And I think that's hard for humans in general to realize that just because you have pain, you know, and... I, as the therapist, am tuning into your partner's pain and seeing and understanding, you know, attuning to them and being with them doesn't negate or cancel out or take away from your pain and your reality. And there is space for both. And and attuning to them is not saying, oh, you're totally right. And your truth is totally wrong. It's not, that's not it at all. No, it's not. And that's another thing we can be so explicit about to say, as we're hearing one person and we're aware of the reaction that the other person is having, we can, we can say very directly, I know that you have a different perspective on this and I want to hear from you too. I just want to finish over here so we can cue them of like, I know, I see you and yeah. Be very explicit about that so people can, okay, I can take a breath. I can wait another minute or two while you listen to my partner, even though I have so much to say that I need you to hear right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. So really just reassuring you guys that, you know, when you have multiple people in the therapy room, you know, the art of tuning into one and and you tune into both and, and sort of the vibe of the couple as well, but being with one doesn't mean that you're dropping the other or negating their experience. So, you know, it's, it's, yeah. we've got to hold both. And so, so, and that's part of the challenge, right? So we have to be talking to one, but be checking, right? You just visually, how is the other person doing or what vibe or are they moving uncomfortably, you know, to let us know, okay, I need to switch over pretty quickly here. Yeah. Right? We can't focus so much that we're missing seeing those nonverbals. So if it's okay with you, let's yeah. sort of like maybe explore, unpack sort of what attunement requires from us. And again, if you're a regular person on the street, like a, you know, someone looking for a therapist or just wanting to improve, you're certainly welcome. You know, uh, had a lot of wonderful everyday folks find their way onto my podcast. I'm like, oh, I think EFT is for me, you know, and that's wonderful. And, and they found EFT therapists. So this is geared mainly towards therapists, but this part is for everybody, you know, to the art of tuning into somebody. Like, what does that really require of a human, a therapist to, to tune in, pick up, you know, before, and we'll we'll talk like second half about what to do with the information that you pick up, but how do you actually like do attunement? <laughs> like okay. on, on the tuning inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um what so as I'm also I'm also thinking about is, is you're thinking if people are potential clients thinking, what how do I know if this is a person who can attune? I often encourage people to get a phone call with the potential therapist and maybe talk to a couple different ones. Just so on that phone call, do I feel like this person is listening to, to me? Do they have time to talk to me, even if it's just for five minutes? Um mm -hmm. yeah. And so so part of it is like even if you're trying to tune into your partner, like learning skills yeah. of attunement yeah. better for betterment of your relationships. Like it yeah. can be hard, you know, especially people would describe themselves as like socially awkward, you know, yeah. is this eye contact, is eye contact a part of attunement? Well, it probably depends on culture, right? Um, what What is normal for where you, what you've learned along the way. But I, I think like in a really basic way, I go back to what I taught my, my sons when they were little and not, I felt like, I felt like they were not listening to me. I would say, I need you to listen with your whole body. Mm -hmm. And so what that meant was don't be doing something else. Don't be looking away um, I in, or trying to get away from me, but like, let's be in the same place and turn toward each other. 
And so we can have a sense of, I'm attending to you. Mm. So there's definitely that piece of, um, when people are yelling at each other from other parts of the room or just even having a conversation so quickly, it can escalate because they're not tuned in. They're not totally hearing each other or they're starting to react, but they don't see the other reaction. So yeah, eye count, contact and presence in the same space is really important. And I'm, I'm sure you've heard and people who are watching have heard so many times the argument between a couple that begins on texts because we say things on text that we wouldn't necessarily say out loud or there's so much shorthand that happens that people misunderstand each other. And it's like... Or your yeah. mood may be likely to filter, you know, the tone of a message that's right. really just tight. <laughs> right. Or, or your mood and how you see what maybe has been typed in a very calm neutral way but you see it differently because it's, it's really just kind of funny if you have someone read you a text like you can always tell how they interpret it by the tone in which yes, they read it. absolutely so there's so much context that's lost mm -hmm. when you only have the words right it's just not enough so you yeah, have to be able to tune in whether it's a partner or to a client or to a child it's mm -hmm. attending with your whole that's that's one of the things i think about um attending oh body yeah you said something it's really important i love what you said about the eye contact thing and it, it sort of brought up something for me you were saying you know it sort of depends on the culture and you know maybe it might be helpful to clarify i think when i mean eye contact especially if you're someone who describes yourself as socially awkward like you know you don't like to lock eyes with somebody I think eye contact doesn't necessarily mean needing to lock eyes with somebody okay, so not like yeah yeah i mean though to be able to meet somebody's eyes and and see them with your own is powerful it's important for our mirror neurons but i think it's the eye contact is also just seeing you know being able part of that listening isn't just with your ears it's with your eyes like if um, you know it it you were saying like you know, if, if couples from another room or they're doing something else, it's like when you're trying to tune into something, let's go back to like a TV program. You know, if you're not really watching, if you're not tuned in, if you're doing something else, they may make a gesture or do something that's silent, that's not using words that if you're not watching with your eyes, you won't be that's able it. to pick it up, you know, so and, and micro expressions that might be contained in the silence or the silence itself the body language, you know, the maybe the avoidance of eye contact, all of those are part of tuning in. And it's, again, those are signals mm -hmm. that we want to pick up on. It's like, when you look, when you tune in, when you see focus, attend, which could also be another word for paying attention to what's happening, right? What what do you see when you tune into the program in front of you, the person, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is attending, right? When it's when it's someone's big emotion, we we are tending to them and and helping hold something that maybe they haven't been able to hold by themselves. So, yeah, mm. for sure. Now, I'm imagining if I'm a person, even a therapist. If I'm a person, <laughs> as I realized so I knew there was more to that sentence. But <laughs> I'm a person, blah blah. blah. If I'm a regular person, non-therapist, but even like a therapist, I know that that key phrase that you said big emotion sometimes feels so scary and it's like people are like oh like I don't want to tune into that right. so I guess it would be what could be the cost of not when when something feels so uncomfortable we we feel like I want to go away from it what could be the cost of doing that um what, the first one that comes to my mind is it, it comes out. It just comes out sideways. So we might be hurt and sad that our partner said something to us, but if we don't say it, whether they think it's not, you think it's not that big of a deal, I need to just get over it, or I don't want to talk about it because it never goes well, and we don't say anything, it's going to come out some other way, some a, a verbal jab somehow, or that withdrawal. Our, it's, our partner is going to know it, right? But if, if we're able to, like, like in, in a therapeutic setting, to be able to make space for that and validate that and help a person feel heard, then it like, it can um, dissipate. The repair can be made. We can help our clients make that repair because we've tuned into that. It becomes more tolerable for them 
it helps the client, the partner tolerate it. And then we can, then they can, you know, over time get to that place where they can provide that relief for each other. Like, Oh, my partner gets me. I can, I'm attached securely now to my partner. And that's, that's the goal. Right. You know, I, st- I start to think about, you know, like this idea of big emotion and how some folks, you know, can become very uncomfortable around big emotion and how that can block, become a block to tuning into somebody. I'm wondering if part of it is because people feel like they have to do something to it or they don't know how to respond to it, what what to do with it. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. um, and, you know, we'll, we'll go a little bit more deeply into what to do with the information you receive. But I'm thinking like the art of attunement, you know, as a, a way of responding with your whole body by giving your focused attention without even necessarily s- saying words. Like I think the first step of attunement is it always involve words. Yeah. So I, I noticed myself as you were talking, I just started nodding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. So it's yeah. that. Is that like, yes, what you're saying makes sense to me. We give that nonverbal, I'm with you, say more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how many times do people come to our office and complain that their partner is not tuned in and the things that they give as examples are totally not anything done with words. It's body language, right? So it's like... My partner's looking somewhere else or they're looking at their phone or, you know, they talk to me, but they're looking at my forehead and not at my eyes and, you know, like just all kinds of different ways that it shows up, you know, so it's like even before we get to the, to the way of responding with words, I think the basic starting point of responding, letting somebody know you're tuned in is like a felt bodily expression of I have your attention does that make yeah. sense <laughs> yeah so I think it's a very embodied thing right if if we're staying in our heads with someone we might say oh that was a good conversation but if there's a tender thing that you're holding and not feeling able to share you're going to leave that saying yeah but I I still am, I'm still alone with this I I haven't that person doesn't really know me and maybe maybe and maybe you might draw the conclusion of like, that's not a person who's interested in that part of me. So mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to keep a protective distance. Um, yeah. 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 That, that's, that's so important. Um, it, you know, I want to actually want to go back to something you said of people have discomfort with big emotion. And I think there are, I'm sure you've discovered this with some of your supervisees. We have therapists who are often uncomfortable with big emotions or with, or with, clients feeling uncomfortable like they want to step in and kind of relieve that discomfort yeah. and so, so one of the tasks that we as therapists have is to discover the places where we are uncomfortable mm-hmm. and get curious about that because otherwise our work is going to kind of stall out a little bit because we we can't take clients to that uncomfortable place so that they can come out the other side. So, yeah, because it can be easy to tune in and stay with someone when they're sharing something that feels compelling or just naturally pulls you in like a gooey Hallmark movie, you know, Mm -hmm. but there's other kinds of emotions. And again, what someone may be uncomfortable with, of course, can vary from person to person, but big emotion, you know, I've seen people, you know, feel really uncomfortable around like sadness, you know, or, you know, anger is one of those ones is like, if somebody is sharing something or emitting a signal that feels like, whoa, you know, kind of icky or scary. Yeah. Yeah. Or big or loud. And it's like, how do I, be with that person it's it's like i wonder if people feel like do do they feel like they need to protect themselves somehow and that can block them from tuning in if it gets big yeah yeah whether it's the therapist protecting themselves from a a client who's angry with them i mean Mm -hmm. that's i don't i don't know anybody who likes that or is like yay my clients got mad at me today um or if they just see their their client is just so distressed, like they, they want to lighten that load. And so maybe they'll switch and talk to the partner. But mm-hmm. that's just the moment when 
the opportunity is to stay stay there. Um, yeah. rush in to fix it mode or something. Yeah, yeah, because of their own discomfort, and that's a place where you know self of therapist stuff is so important. It's like what did what did the therapist learn about emotions as a kid? What was okay? What was not okay? What was yeah, you know. So that's that's where tuning in. And includes, like you're saying, doing your work, whether it's with a therapist or a mentor or whomever of where am I getting blocked myself so that I, because I can't, if I can't go there, I can't, my clients aren't going to go there. I guess maybe what comes up for me is maybe like a thought of dispelling some myths about attunement right there is that if somebody is sharing something like, let's just say a person is angry with me and they're showing big angry emotion that feels really uncomfortable but you know i'm hearing that tuning in and being with them could be very helpful you know for the benefit of the relationship you know i'm thinking like you know it's my mind might go to if if i'm tuning in does that somehow mean i'm taking punches or that I'm agreeing with what they're saying. And, you know, if I don't agree or it feels hurtful that I need to protect myself. Though, so that means I can't tune in and pick up what they're putting down. Yeah. Yeah. So a couple of things come to mind as you say that I'm actually remembering a client who was very mean to a partner in session. And in those moments, I think we do need to lean in and say, that is not okay. Mm -hmm. um, to use that kind of language here, I have to block. And so I would block something like that. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, that was the first thing that came to my mind. But I think it's it's where is the best we're able to lean in and and you know validate. I see that you're angry. I, this is really important to you. It makes a lot of sense. I I and then and then like even in my own mind, I almost feel that what we feel sometimes is like, uh, then what do I do now? But then it's when you have to tune in and say, what's going on for me and, and what's going on for my client? And there's a human who is upset. Is this their normal strategy? Is this what they do? And now, now they're doing it with me, and now I'm in a cycle with them. So it's mm -hmm. it's like moving through my own big reaction because I don't like it when people are mad at me. Mm -hmm. But there's a reason, and what's the reason? And what's the hurting human underneath this anger? What's going on for them? And can I have the presence to take a breath if I need it? Mm -hmm. uh, not drop them. Yeah, it's quite a complicated dance sometimes, isn't it? But that's what you're saying is really good because what I kind of hear again is that attunement, picking up what someone's laying down and, and focusing and attending to it isn't the same as as agreeing with something or taking right. hurtful behavior. I, I think that you would only even be able to understand that if you were attuning, right? Like right. I can tune in and I can hear what you're saying. I can I can pick up that you're angry, that your body is you know, getting like aroused with, with anxious energy or angry energy or, or whatever emotion it is. I can see your, you know, skin turning flush, you know, whatever. I, I can see that your eyes are pointing downwards. You know, I can hear the tone of your voice change, like all those things, you know, tuning in is like, it's like information. You're, you're picking up information signals that's being laid down. It's not the same as saying I agree or it, the way that you're transmitting it is okay. It's just saying there's a transmission here. Here's what I'm picking up in the transmission, transmission received, you know. Got so, your message. Yeah. yeah. And it feels right. like the more tuned in you are, the more you're able to maybe accurately pick up what the you know with with better with better accuracy the information that is being laid down and maybe have more flexibility or yeah discernment with what to do how to properly respond to the information that is being given yeah 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 i think that's right as you're tuning in with that other person um and I'm thinking it, and it, it varies depending on, is this your first session and they're really mad at you? Probably not. People usually save that for a few sessions or many sessions later. Um, but to mm -hmm. pay attention, like try to get the whole picture. And and if something, or what it makes me think of right in the moment is that sometimes something happens between the client in front of you and it happens so fast. And suddenly there's a big reaction and they're having at it with each other. And you're like, what in the world has happened? Right. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and so that's when um, recording is so important. You can go back and you can see the nonverbal. You can hear the tone of voice or you can you can see one partner's nonverbal reaction to what the other one said and said, oh, that's where it happened. Something's going on right there. I need to get curious with them about that moment. Um, to, so, cause, I, cause sometimes we're not tuned in. We're just like, I, what just happened here? Mm-hmm. Right. You get to the end of a session and you're like, oh my goodness, that was hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what do we do with those moments is, you know, we hopefully have a recording or we've got some friends we can talk about, um, some therapists that, that are, um, like we call them study buddies in Chicago. Like I'm always encouraging people, find your, find your, your little group of one or two people that you talk about your clients with, where you you get the permission from a client to do consult, get some consulting on it and look at your videos. I, I had one of those meetings this morning with some, some friends of mine and wow, that's really helpful when you're not tuned in and you've missed something. Um, Mm -hmm. And it sounds like also maybe it's important to say, hey, let's be compassionate with each other, guys, because we're not always going to catch every bit of information that flies past us (laughs) because people can be giving so many things and, you know, from even just one single person. And then if there's multiple people in your therapy room or in your social situation, it can become even harder, you know, because there's multiple things to attend to. Yeah, then you sort of have to decide, you know, sort of a decision making tree. What's what's the first order of attending? Who do I attend to first? And what's the most important and prioritizing? So it's okay, guys, if you miss mm-hmm. some things, you know, and that leads yeah, we, we all do it, no matter what level yeah. you're at, right? You miss stuff, I miss stuff, we go yeah. back and figure it out. Yeah. So that's the second part is so okay, so if we're tuning in and we're trying to pick up the information signals, how do we understand or make sense out like how do we interpret the information that's being transmitted like what are all what all are we hanging in on um that's a good question well i think we always have to come with a stance of curiosity um especially as we're getting to know a couple we don't know right but to tell everyone why curiosity is like our go-to stance any of because because we because we wow if we think we know it all we're, we're not going to be attuned. We're going to be like, you're feeling sad. You're feeling disappointed. And people are like, that's not how I feel. Right. They may feel so, so, judged. <laughs> yeah. Or like, you're not listening. You don't get me. But if, but curiosity comes with the conjectures, right? Where I'm noticing something. I'm wondering what's going on with you. And I, I say this a lot. I could be wrong. I could be going down a wrong trail. But I'm wondering if. Mm, yeah you're feeling you know that you're feeling disappointed that you're feeling dismissed and the stance of openness the stance of openness and when it's sorry to chase us down a rabbit hole (laughs) yeah sorry that's the way conversations go one of the things that i do to tune in in the session um is when when a client makes a gesture like i was and i was trying to think of an example to give us but one a a person was saying it's all on me Mm -hmm. and she was pointing at her shoulders and we you know repetition um is one of the things we do and so i repeated her words it's all on you i also repeated her gesture when i did that it's all on you and that's a way for me to bring her experience into my body and so when i do the gesture ah and i'm thinking my eyes go up my clients know if i'm looking at the ceiling i'm thinking it's all on me and i'm like does that feel heavy and she's, if I ask, because it's a question, it gives my client space to say yes or no. But if, if I'm really tuned in, she'll be, she'll be like, yes, it's very heavy. And then we've just advanced a little bit in her experience. She knows I'm getting her, but it's that reflection of the words, the physicality and me pausing and really imagining what that's like, bringing it into my body. That then, you know, sometimes the, that word comes up and it's sometimes it's not a word they connect with, but sometimes it's just the right word that they didn't have in mind two seconds before. I didn't have in mind two seconds before. It's, you know, it's not magic, but it's that truth of when we are really attuned, we can put a word on it, put an experience on it, then our clients feel felt and we've taken the process just a little bit closer to 
what's really going on here and how can now that I help you partner feel the heaviness mm. that this person's feeling because she feels like it's all on her. Yeah. So it kind of feels like in some way you're saying being able to come in with curiosity. Also, I'm thinking if I'm just a regular non-therapist person trying to, again, improve social situations. And even for therapists in session, I think it's just a handy social skill. Yeah. Like coming in with curiosity sort of frees me from feeling like I have to accurately assume or understand exactly what information signals are being transmitted by somebody rather than just understanding that there are information signals being transmitted and to be able to pick up on what kinds of signals are being sent and then to say, oh, I know it's like with curiosity, we don't have to like, oh, I think you're really pissed because you're doing this or you're doing that or you must be sad. You know, somebody has a tear, but it could be a tear of sadness. You know, it could be a tear, could be a tear of joy, not all it's tears. Anger, of sadness, right? but yeah, angry tears, you know, so it's like, you don't have to automatically know what the signal means. It's just pick up on the fact that there's a signal, which just lets somebody know you're with me because you're paying attention to the fact right. that I'm sending signals and you care enough to check it out and to notice, which is huge for people. And so coming in with curiosity is like frees me from feeling like I have to know exactly what that signal means. Like, Oh, I know that you're making a gesture with your hand or you shrugged your eyes or you did this, but I have no idea what that means. It's like, that's okay. <laughs> Get curious. Yeah. So, you know, Hey, I noticed that you, honey, you shrugged your shoulders right there and you sort of look down at the floor. Can you tell me what that means? <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. And so as a therapist, we can be, um, knowledgeable about the model. So we know, like I tend to think, I know I'm looking for sad, scared, shame, joy maybe, but I, I know what I'm looking for. I don't know the particular words and like, like you say, the particular cues that this client has to tell me, but I know I'm looking for things in those categories of emotion. So I, so that um, kind of funnels my, my conjectures into certain places but I still want to learn and be curious about the unique experience of this person, this couple, this family. Um, yeah. And then they feel that, that we're not putting them in a box, but we want to know them uniquely. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like that. And I think, you know, too, what you're saying is it's not just the, the content of the words that someone might be saying that is the, it's not a single thing that we're listening for picking up on. It's body language, you know, the way they may shift their stance or their gait, the facial expressions, especially if it's a culture that isn't verbally emotive, but, you know, uses more micro expressions. You may have to rely more on the information from body language, um, but also it's, it's also like the tone of somebody's voice. And um, I know Polly Vagel talks about that. It, it, what's fascinating is it says, you know, people, and, and you'll hear clients talk about this also, and, and you've probably experienced this as a person is like, somebody will say one thing like, no, I'm not, no, I'm not angry, but their tone of their voice says something completely different. And you're like, well, I don't believe that at all because I'm getting all these other signals. So it's a mixed yeah. signal. So polyvagal science says, you know, we can mask, try to, we can give mixed signals from other parts of our, you know, body or, or language that communicates, but the tone of your voice is the dead giveaway. Every single, it's the only unambiguous cue of danger or safety, according to our brain, which is fascinating because it's true. You know, when someone says, I'm fine, <laughs> you know, but they, they like change that tone of their voice and you're like, mm, I'm not fine with your selling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so much. Yeah. And the, our vo the voice also tells us how much a person is feeling like i'm i always am teaching people pay attention to the pace and the the register that a person is speaking in is if they're fast and high not in a vulnerable space mm -hmm. if they're slowing down and the voice is in a lower register mm -hmm. um they might be in a place of discovery or a place of tenderness and so pay attention to 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 how, like just like what you're saying that those verbal cues to say mm -hmm. okay if i'm wanting to get to a tender place we are not there yet right yeah. or, or we that person is maybe they're not moving but the voice has changed and it's like oh there's something here what can i what can i find that's going to help us mm -hmm. 
get to our goal of connection. And this may sound funny. Like I've had people who often feel like misunderstood. Like they, they notice that people are attuning to them, but they feel like they're always misunderstanding them. And, you know, so in exploring it, it's like it, it seems to be a reoccurring pattern of the outside world picking up or, or, you know, interpreting the same cue. And so I say, you know, maybe the attunement we need to work on is the self attunement, right? If you are genuinely feeling happy, but, you know, maybe yeah. you or someone who'd say I have RBF, <laughs> you know, or I, I say RGF, rump, resting grump face, you know, something oh, like that, yeah. where it's like, people assume you're angry when you're not, then, you know, oh. I would say like, go to the mirror or, you know, do a, an exercise with a friend where you start practicing, making sure okay. what you're transmitting outwardly matches what's happening inwardly. Because sometimes we've not really focused on our tuned into ourselves to make sure that we are giving clear signals to the outside world, which right. can help when people are trying to tune into us. And so that we can avoid you know, at least on our end, help as much as possible to avoid people misreading our cues. Does that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what I'm thinking, I don't know that I've ever actually said this to a client, but I know I've said to like friends, like when they're happy, I'm like, tell your face. Yeah. <laughs> tell your face that you're happy. Right. Um, or my, my husband was watching me talk to somebody once and he, he told me later, like my, my tone was kind of monotone until some point in the conversation when I smiled mm -hmm. and he's like, that changed it. He's like, you need to smile more when you're on the phone. And I'm like, well, that's weird, but it's like, it, it like transmitted to my voice and sounded more cheerful to the person on the other end. So and it's amazing how something as simple as that can affect, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm happy, but. My face is not saying I'm happy and the tone of my voice might be following and then you smile and it's like you can hear it in the tone yeah. of the voice. Yeah. And there's also a piece of like training and culture and it, the environment you grow up in that influences that. I was speaking with a colleague who um, grew up in a, a former Soviet Union space and she was saying she was speaking about herself and she was saying people who have grown up in that place have learned to be guarded with and just not show much. Mm -hmm. And so there's a survival element, like she was describing of, you just don't do that. And it's not, she, she, she was reacting to something somebody else said, and she said, it's not because we're stoic, we're not stoic, but we are guarded. And mm -hmm. so there's good reason. Show your cards. <laughs> Yeah, so there's good reason why some why people have learned not to show on their faces what they're feeling. Um, it's but funny, I, I use a Vegas uh, term for that because oh, uh, oh, showing your cards because you know, yeah, we have professional right. poker players, and and I'll say like sure. I've had some yeah, that don't yeah, yeah they don't fit into the you know I don't I don't want to say like every single poker player is this way professional poker like, players it's, it's like call saying, it, yeah. a poker face right yes yes. <laughs> yeah, they're trained because if you give emotion, it can give someone a right. cue as to what's in. What are your tells that you have a good hand or a bad hand, right? Yeah. You show it, right? So there are reasons and environments where that's probably a really good thing. But with our, our loved ones, with the person that we want to be close with, it's a strategy that's not working. And so one of the things we do as therapists, and I'll say this, and I'm sure you have as well to clients to say, keep that strategy out there in the outside world. You need that. You know, we talk about like first responders, they need that not to let those emotions get activated when they're on the job, but with your partner, with the people that you love, with your friends, well, let's, can, can we find a strategy that's going to help you feel closer, closer to them, help them feel closer to you. So yeah, strategy and like where you're doing that. It's like about like, flexibility you're, you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, right. Right. we're not right. saying this particular strategy is bad all the time because clearly there's a function utility for it. It's just saying like we don't want to be a one trick pony because it's not going to help us survive right. in every single situation. Right. Like right. knowing your audience, knowing your situation, you know, you need to be able to be flexible to adjust. And I think that brings up another important aspect of attunement that I didn't even think about before is tuning into your surroundings 
And, you know, like the social situation, you know, like the way that I tune in and communicate to my boss, I'm going to tune in and adjust maybe the cues I give or the way I communicate differently than if I was at home communicating with my spouse or to my toddler. Yeah, right. And the power is part of that. If there's a power differential, you're going to present yourself differently than where, where you're the person in power, you're with an equal. Yeah, mm -hmm. we modify all the time. So yeah, we, it's that flexibility, which is so much mm -hmm. of what we to work with with our clients because they've come into our sessions with when it's a couple with a rigid strategy or an individual you know this is how we operate families we, we get into this place and it's not working anymore because our strategy is rigid so yeah. We, we, yeah i'm so glad you mentioned the word flexibility because that's such a big part of yeah. what we're trying to help people get to and i know we we have to start winding down but before we do i'm wondering if we could maybe quickly talk about some things that might block attunement. I mean, I know we mentioned like big emotion, like our own discomfort with things could become a block inside of us, but what other kinds of things could block us from tuning in? Yeah. Um, so I was thinking of, so, so again, some of it is, is our own stuff. I think it often blocks our attunement, whether it's the set a previous session that was hard and took a lot out of us maybe we're not quite ready for this next one and so sometimes that's a scheduling thing not being over scheduled so that we have the emotional mental energy to tune in with a client um fatigue. Was, <laughs> what's that if fatigue yeah fatigue is real or burnout is real like when was the last time you took some time off mm. uh Another, I was talking with someone just yesterday who has a very angry client and this therapist had a very angry parent. And so the client reminds the therapist of the parent. And so the client might, the therapist gets a little dysregulated in the presence of this client. So it can be our own history with emotion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes it's also like the pressure we put on ourselves. Like I have to get to an enactment because I'm supposed to, or I have to complete the tango because I'm supposed to, or someone told me yesterday i'm the third therapist and if if i can't help them then i don't know what's going to happen to them we take on too much responsibility for a client's story than is ours to take or um i i'm working with someone now who was like i wouldn't come to therapy but my a, a mutual friend of yours and mine referred me to you so here i am and but emotions are crap and <laughs> and i was like okay, that feels like pressure, right? Like I have to make something happen fast. And that's, I'm not going to do my best work when I'm under pressure. Um, yeah, I yeah. think of too, like when we're first learning EFT, like, you know, our brain has to do two process. One, we have to try to be present and, and yes. you know, attuned to what's happening. But then our brain is also trying to stay in the model and figure out like, where am I in the steps and stages? Yes. And I got to find my footing. You know, and, and so part of your brain gets busy. So it's hard to be fully yeah. present. And, um, you know, like you said, fatigue, burnout. And and I'll say another big one out there can be some of our neurodiversity. Um, you know, I have ADHD and, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, sometimes what blocks my attunement isn't, you know, like I don't necessarily lack the desirability to tune in. It's that I'm also like my brain is busy constantly. So it's like I'm here and I'm there and I'm everywhere. And so not fully being here, you know, which is a hallmark symptom of someone with ADHD and, and other things as well is like, we're always out of body and out of moment. And that can make it hard to pick up right what's in front of you, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know if you want to say, but what helps you in those moments when you realize, oh, I'm here, there, everywhere? How I, do you have to I catch it. I recognize, oh, I'm like in the next moment or I'm thinking about this, come back. Like, you know, there's times where sometimes I'll catch it in session. It's like, I just pop out and I'm thinking about like, dinner i'm like oh shoot i just totally missed what they said oh my god you know i get embarrassed and i'll be like um i i'm not quite sure i understood could you <laughs> i mean there's like some sly ways to come back but uh, yeah. you know it's really you know again it, it does require attunement i think to yourself to recognize where you are when you lose your focus bringing it back in you know and and Sometimes it looks like misattunement, but it's like also with neurodivergence, it's understanding what's in front of us. So our brain also gets busy trying to synthesize 
And so it's like, you know, we may be stuck on a cue that happened, you know, a minute ago, and we've missed some other things. And so we're like trailing behind or we're like 10 steps ahead. And it's like, well, wait, wait a second, you've just had this whole conversation without me and left me in the dust, <laughs> you know, and missed what was actually going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so sometimes I will, uh, I'll take that on myself. I'll be like, you know what, I'm still thinking about something you said a minute ago. Can we go back there? Mm -hmm. And so I just own it. Um, mm -hmm. And, and often people will follow you back because uh, as long as, you know, interrupting well is a, certainly an EFT skill that we work on, but to yeah. be able to, to, to kind of admit, oh, I wasn't, I'm not attending to what you're telling me right now. I'm still back here. Um, and that can be a way to, also, it can be a way to interrupt the story that they, the content that they keep telling yeah. us. Um, yeah. And then, it, I, and I love what you're saying. There's, there's a huge part of being able to attune to ourself and, and having practices that we do like mindfulness, like as you're driving or when you're talking with family of coming back to the moment, coming back to the moment. So we have to be training ourselves to be noticing, you know, what am I feeling and what, what does anxiety feel like um, in my body? So that when somebody tells me about their anxiety, I'm like, Oh yeah, I know what that's like. Mm -hmm. So I, and I, I've been thinking a lot lately about how do we help people learn to attune who've never learned. Mm. Uh, I've started beginning sessions with, I won't say all of my clients, but a lot of my clients with just like two minutes of mind mindfulness of like, breathe with me, mm -hmm. notice and do a brief body scan. And then I invite them, what did you notice? Because mm -hmm. I want them to learn with me as a guide, how to mm -hmm. notice their own bodies so that when they're not with me, They've got a sense of, oh, this is what she means when she said, notice how you react, blah, 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 blah. They have some sense of, oh, that it's what we do in session. I'm supposed to do that outside of session. Yeah. I think that's so powerful is that attunement isn't just outwardly to our surroundings and the people around us. And that's a big part of it, but it's also attunement to ourself, like focusing on, on paying attention to what's happening inside of us. You know, how are we feeling? What are we thinking? How does that cause you know or affect the way that we show up or react in the moment what do we do with those things you know and a lot of times we can be out of attunement with ourselves, and and i think the cost of that can be giving mixed signals to the outside world you know or having a lot of unclear signals because we don't even know what we're trying to say because we're not clear we're not clear on what we're feeling and we don't know how to tune in and, and really check out and understand what we feel you know, and sometimes paying attention to what we feel can also feel scary. And I think that can be another block if you aren't used to doing that, or you're maybe afraid of what you might find out, you know, that can become certainly a, a barrier, you know, to attunement that can be worked through, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah. But it's that noticing of like, it might even be noticing like, oh, I have a couple couples now who yeah, when it gets uncomfortable, I switch and talk to the partner. Oh, okay, maybe I need to start paying attention to this move I have and what's going on there, right? Yeah. So, well, yeah. this is so amazing, Gretchen. I'm just so appreciative for you and your wisdom. And um, so if if there's folks outside um, mm -hmm. in the EFT community, you know, that would like to get a training from you or follow you, like how can people find you? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So I am the trainer in Chicago and our website is chicagoeft.com. Super simple, chicagoeft.com. Um, so there's information about the, the officially sanctioned um, trainings on there. We have an uh, in-person externship in Chicago, uh, 2024. At the last week of June is a beautiful time usually to be in Chicago. It's a great place to come when the uh, training's going to be right in the heart of the city, um, so very close to the lake. So that would be a really fun place if for people who are like, I'm done with online trainings. I want to do something in person. Please come to the externship June 2024. Um, my website is relationshipworks.life. So it's relationship one works, has an S on the it, works plural dot L-I-F-E. Um, yeah, and you can contact me through that. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm so excited. I will make sure that I put the link for your website in Chicago EFT in the description for this video. Oh, and 
you know, if, if you're just somebody who's interested in receiving EFT therapy and you might be in the Chicago area, you know, you can certainly look up Gretchen and um, get in touch with you through your website so that they can work yeah. with you or yeah. maybe and super supervision as well of working with Perfect. therapists who are learning EFT. Yeah. Or email yeah. you and invite you to come to their EFT home community for a training yeah. on the two <laughs> That'd be awesome. That Thank would be you. wonderful. Awesome. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us today and just for the gift of your wisdom and, and uh, your expertise. So thank you so much. And thank mm -hmm. you so much to our viewers for watching and staying tuned. Make sure you guys pick up my EFT book on uh, relentless empathy and the therapeutic relationship, working with challenging, uh, connecting with challenging <laughs> and, and resistant clients <laughs> i published it a while it's such a long title a long it's, title right the publisher maybe change it but you can get it on amazon um just type in on a bell bugatti relentless empathy and amazon you can get sue Johnson endorsed it and it's really awesome easy conversational read but guys awesome. make sure that you look up gretchen and that you get in touch with her and if you're interested about other eft trainings you can go to icef which is our head organization for eft if you want to come to vegas and train with me you can go to our Southern Southern Nevada EFT is a community I lead, snveft.com. Otherwise, guys, thank you for staying tuned and make sure that y'all hit subscribe because more videos are on the way. Don't forget to buy my book, Using Relentless Empathy in the Therapeutic Relationship, Connecting with Challenging and Resistant Clients for Helping Professionals, available on Amazon or on my website www.drbugatti.com.